Welcome back. Uh, the last speaker of this morning is Jordi Crespo. Jordi is a PhD in philosophy, epistemology, and history of culture. His dissertation revolved around the anonymous Londoniensis of appearance of medical content in Greek from the first century CE. Before that, he had course other related studies to this field, an MA in ancient philosophy, another MA in classics, and another MA in history of religions. In addition to this, he has uh, worked for four terms as an associate lecturer of different subjects in philosophy at the Department of Humanities for the Pompeo Fabra University of Barcelona. The most part of the research he has conducted to the moment falls in the fields of philosophy and medicine in antiquity. However, his interests go beyond the antiquity and prove also broader than the aforementioned disciplines. Evidence of that are the research lines of the clusters in which he takes part, influence of Greek ethics on contemporary philosophy and Eidos, Plato, and modernity. This combination of interests in particular was precisely what pushed him to get close to philosophy as a way of life and to realize that it is into this trend where he feels intellectually comfortable and where he is willing to direct his effort. Uh, the title of his presentation today is From Galen to Loyola, some remarks about the foundations and scope of philosophy as a way of life. Uh, so there's a moment. Uh, sorry, I think the microphone is off. Yeah, that's better, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. perfect. Thank you. I am, uh, there's a small mistake here in the sense that no worries about that, but the, uh, uh, I do not belong to Pompeo Fabra anymore. So I'm a kind of independent researcher, so to speak. But I work for the Pompeo Fabra, uh, and I have some kind of good memories of that time. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, this is a, a kick, kick off conference. Uh, I would like not to be it to be a kicking off English conference, <laughs> but I'll try to do my best as regards the vehicular language. Um, so, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I uh, should like to express my gratitude in the first instance to Professor Elder Cello and Marta Coschino for the kind invitation. I feel very honored to take part in this Congress and to have the opportunity to share with you some of the concerns which I have encountered while reading and conducting research on this fascinating philosophical journey that Pierre Adore set out. Uh, I'm also very glad to be here because nowhere else could the points I'm about to raise in the next minutes be best received and discussed. The thing will go this way. I will, uh, show, uh, on the screen, you will see some extract fragments from, from uh, the Loge de la Philosophie Antique, the inaugural discourse that uh, Pierre gave uh, when he took over the chair of Philosophic Philosophy at the Collège de France. And this will be the heading to introduce the contents I would like to expound to you uh, today. So my first contention today, is, today aims at pointing out the inconsistence of the abbreviation PWL. Standing for philosophy as a way of life, it is the most commonly used in the majority of scholarly contributions and by most of the scholars in this field. <clears throat> It has always seemed striking to me that this friendly stream arising from Paul Rabot and Pierre Adol would have been disseminated as PWL. Should like to bring to your attention this which is no minor, minor detail. When someone has no qualms about writing about having a PhD on their CV, it is because by these they mean they have been awarded a doctor in philosophy, where the PH dot corresponds to philosophy and the D dot uh, to doctor. Philosophy is a compound noun of Greek origin, uh, philosophia, whose first and seventh letters are P, which is a different letter to P, uh, like the rational number 3, 14, 16, and so forth, and ask me much more. 
Uh, if you ever happen to be in a hotel in Greece and the pin code to get Wi-Fi would include the letter P, <clears throat> you can take for granted that no matter how many times you might try to log in by introducing and tapping the letter P, you'd never get connected to the net. In the Greek alphabet, P, C, and Phi represent a voiceless bilabial plosive sound, the combination of this sound with a sigmatic awareness created sound, respectively. In transliterating philosophia into Latin as philosophia, the Romans did so because they, to their ears, those letters did not sound as a simple P, but probably they could hear a kind of feeble aspirated sound after the sound P, leading them to transcript the word philosophia with a PH and not with a P. Analogously, when in the Constellation of Philosophy, Boethius describes the visit that philosophia made to him while he was in prison, Matthew still thought that the Parisian was dressed up in a white clothes where he could perfectly distinguish the letters P and theta, sending for praxis and theory, respectively. Whenever I use the Richard form PWL, I get the impression of being reproducing what, in my view, is an inexplicable mistake which could easily be fixed. So, for the sake of consistency, at least, I suggest that from now onwards, when using the abridged form of philosophy as a way of life, we should start writing P H W L with the non capitalized H beside the capitalized P. Mm. Uh, just assume I'm a very kind person. So, <laughs> having said this, I have set forward to introduce the five points I should like to raise. Needless to say, with the following remarks. I'm neither intending to be exhaustive nor exclusive, in the sense that they are but a small sample among the number of different points which could be used. They result from my partial, imperfect, subjective, and by us knowledge of the subject matter. Furthermore, they are far from being clear cut categories. On the contrary, they come rather interwoven and tend to intersect at different points of their many sides. According to the order of exposition, the first point in the layout that I shall tackle, uh, shall tackle is about the original motivations and goals triggering the philosophy as a way of life. A, leaving aside some well known exceptions, the majority of scholars working on philosophy as a way of life are little acquainted or unacquainted with the classical languages from which they draw their arguments. Moreover, the French origin of the philosophy as a way of life, as well as several significant contributions to philosophy as a way of life made from the French cultural milieu, are undermined because of the dominance of English as vehicular language of culture. Of course, it is not the first that will be it the last time that the dissemination and acceptance of a cultural trend to be subject to changes of language. For language shift actually accounts for the historic success a good deal of cultural and religious trends. Yet sort of double issue comes in here. For, by the former point, I'm thinking of either the extent to which and the depth in which the new ideas and projects on the philosophy as a way of life should be grounded in the knowledge of classical languages, a situation applicable not only to classical languages, but also to the range of non-Western languages. Uh, at the basis of the contributions to the philosophy as a way of life from an interdisciplinary perspective. Sometimes you get struck by the way that some Greek and Latin concepts of philosophical import are translated into modern languages. For these often seem having been simply dispatched regardless of accuracy. As Martin Heidegger once pointed out, there's a set of fundamental notions on philosophy to give them the name of Comte de which are there from the very onset of the discipline, which take on new or slight differences in meaning as time goes on, and they are used in different schools of philosophy and by different authors. Although I'm fully conscious of the massive work behind the addition of text and the difficulties involved, I do not regard myself as a philologist or a papyrologist. Therefore, I'm not pretending to play the role of the defender of philology. Being at hand in most of modern languages, the majority of classical texts equated to us from the ancients, the philology's death comes more than justified. And presumably, 
they will be they will have their own means to defend themselves and set the boundaries to their expertise. My concern about this first point rises from the assumption that the orientation given to the contributions to come in the field of the philosophy as a way of life might show eventual counterproductive effects, both all in the light of the worry that are all manifested in regard to the gradual professionalization that philosoph uh, philosophical activity uh, has experienced ever since the Middle Ages and the subsequent need to take it off the university departments of philosophy and philology. This is a problem which calls for the average style we should display and what sort of potential we see we should bear in mind when writing down our ideas. It is often hard to coast on the line between an excessive erudition and meaningless gossip. Does it mean that philosophy as a way of life should bind itself to the discourse of a bunch of happy learned ones? Wouldn't that be in conflict with making philosophy have a direct bearing on people's everyday lives again? One of the main goals in philosophy as a way of life. Then what's the supposed way of combining ancient with modern and contemporary philosophy? So everybody's likely to admit that this is a fundamental point on the agenda of philosophy as a way of life. So we can see the philosophers to be a sort of technicians trained in a set of hyper-specific skills, allowing them to grasp the outcome by philologists to make it accessible, more comprehensible, to a greater audience. If that would be the case, wouldn't this activity misrepresent and pervert the alleged perfection and wholeness of the philosophic lifestyle? As regards the latter remark in this first point concerning the underrating of different problematics and authors on the grounds of their French region, I would like to make mention of Jackie Pigeot and Véronique Boudonniou, a couple of French philologists whose, contribu whose contributions, though their value, are underrepresented. As far as my knowledge allows me to claim, and as I shall try to work later in more detail, Pigeot and Boudon's new insight into ancient medicine is worth being taken into consideration because their outstanding works open a window to deepening some key tenets in philosophy as a way of life from a medical approach, a complementary view which, in the way they take and expound it, certainly fits well with the lines of philosophy as a way of life. To put an end to this first point, I shall remind you that some remarkable studies in the field of philosophy as a way of life are yet to be translated into English. Just to recall some notable ones, Il se trouve à vous, Sénèque, de l'action spirituelle et pratique de la philosophie, remains acceptable only to German and French leadership. And in Cloutry, with her husband, Pierre Ado, apprendre la philosophie dans l'Antiquité is only available in French. Now, oh, let's move on. I'm not really good at this kind of things, to be honest. Okay. Although Paul Rabot and Pierre stress the value of Plutarch and Galen, we to underline their uniqueness as authors or to highlight the key role that both played in the preservation and transmission of the ideas of those who preceded them. The fact remains, however, that little attention has been paid to either authors from the specific perspective of the philosophy as a way of life. So say on a few words about Plutarch before going to consider Galen as a source of the adverse value and the time to get a better appreciation of some of the points in the philosophy of ancient authors. And here we also bolstering the aforementioned convenience of the contributions made by Pigeot uh, and Boulogne. Raghuov is credited with being one of the founders of philosophy as a way of life and having set the cornerstones of its theoretical frame. The reference work in this sentence is the Alan Fion, Methodic in the Antica from 1954. What is perhaps less known is that he started analyzing different forms of freedom of the soul much more earlier than he did in his classical Alan Fion, almost 40 years earlier, in 1914. Precisely with a survey of some practices oriented to the rhythms of the soul in Plutarch. Therefore, the fundamental intuition surrounding the philosophy as a way of life could well be traced back to the second decade of the 20th century. 
Bevin, the title Antike Schriften über Sonnenheilung und Sonnenleitung auf ihre Quellen untersucht, and the subtitle Die Therapie des Zorns. I wanted to study on the pieces of advice given by Plutarch on the treatment of anger, a patient which was widely discussed by Seneca and many other ancient authorities. To put it all in a nutshell, and if I had properly understood it, in Antike Schriften über Sellenheilung und Sellenleitung, Abu puts Plutarch's De Coivenda Ira in brilliance with Seneca's De Ira in order to show that, to some extent, the latter drew from Posidonius Perioarges, the Epimian Stoic from the second and the first centuries before Christian era. The apparent and important of, of these bookish remarks serves to bring Galen of Pergamon into discussion and more importantly at a personal level to realize that the research I'm conducting at the moment on Galen St. Jolentia corresponds to some of the demands posited by Pierre Adol in his inaugural speech and seems also to be along with the working lines of Rabot despite more than 100 years having elapsed. After having produced the indolentia for quite a long time now, I'm in a position to say that it bears actual evidence for the transmission of a spiritual exercise, the prefiguration of the future evils, the primary capture of Malorum, elsewhere than among the Stoics, by these I mean the Syrianites, in a context which is alien to all sorts of religious tradition, and from classical antiquity and the Hellenistic period to the end of the second century uh, Christian era. For the sake of time, I cannot go into detail, but please consider that sections 52 and 77 in Galen's and Galen's De Indolentia reproduce a fragment of a lost tragedy by Euripides titled Iseus, in which Galen himself also quotes in the Placitis Hippocrates et Platonis which Plutarch reproduces in his Consolatio to Apollonium, and which Cicero collects in the Tusculum Disputationis, from which I draw the conclusion that, and as far as the conjecture allows me, the exercise of the prayer meditatio malorum can be attributed to Anaxagoras of Plutomini, the pre-Socratic philosopher and Euripides student. The results of this inquiry will hopefully see the light of day by the end of this current year in the Boletino della Società Italiana di Filosofia. Now, here you are, here you have the text extracted from Galen St. Dolentia. Uh, for you are well aware that observation of politics is a good teacher by reminding us of the action of fortune. What Euripides put into the mouth of his ears, somewhere is true above all, as you will recognize when you hear. As I once learned from, a wise, learned from a wise man, I felt to constantly in disasters constantly, adding for myself exiled from my native land, and timely death and all the ways of misfortune, so that should I ever suffer any of what I was imagining, I might not know all at my soul because it was a noble arrival. The wise man constantly reminds himself of everything that he might possibly suffer. Thirdly, what has been said a proposal of Galen switch the most to recall a series of issues involved in the making of the theoretical frame of philosophy as a way of life. To a considerable extent, the, the, the theoretical grounds of philosophy as a way of life are built up on a manipulation of time and gaming with time. The fundamental human experience, ah, Lincoln, might be, however, erratic and make us incur mistakes. On the one hand, a good deal of Fadot's work endorsement revolves around rejecting the objection that Jason John Madison Cooper wrote to him in Pursuits of Wisdom. Even much later, after the tradition of philosophy as a way of life had long been well established, some Cicero and Galen, uh, who valued philosophy highly, studied it assiduously and recommended it to others, did not approach the subject in that spirit, spirit which Hadot vindicates. As I remarked previously, some particular contents in the Indolentia set us in a better position to lessen the categorical pretensions of the criticism that Cooper leveled against Hado. From this criticism, a <clears throat> series of studies have issued starting to trace Hado's theories as back up to the history of Western ideas as possible, and as to the far with non Western philosophical tradition based very hypothesis allowed. 
And philosophy is a way of life, as well as in some other contributions. Although it calls to be continuity between some practices in the schools of philosophy from the Hellenistic period and some practices in Christian monasticism. Furthermore, although claims that the origin of the practices and exercise of featuring the philosophic lifestyle not to be bound to the imperial period, as Rabot had argued, but traceable to Plato and even more backwards in time to the pre-Socratics. By this assumption, although it seems to have inherited and valid the views previously posited by Werner Jäger in his essay on the origin and cycle of the philosophic ideal of life, 1928, which taking the format of a supplement was added to the English version of his Aristotle, fundamental of the history of his development. Among others, in this essay, Jäger set forth the thesis that the issue of the Jared of life appears only with the threefold platonic division of the soul, whatever it might be. And as a consequence, the problematization of the philosophic way of life has its roots in the frame of Platonism and makes sense only from Plato onwards. Likewise, although its intuition matches particularly well with the contents and views in another classical book by Jäger, Early Christianity and Greek Idea, 1961. This book, was contemporary, so to speak, with the publication of two of the most important textual findings as to the comprehension of the ins and outs of early Christianity is concerned. The Dead Sea Scroll, also known as the Qumran Library, um, the first century Christian era, and the 13 volumes of the Coptic Gnostic Library of Nag Hammadi, uh, third to fourth centuries Christian era. These stand as the oldest textual witnesses to which we have access as regards the so-called solution of continuity between the hidden philosophy and the sidetrack non-canonical writings of early Christianity. Insight into the writings of both findings reveals that no trace of hidden culture, I mean, not strictly Jewish, can be found in the former set of manuscripts. On the contrary, the authors and copies of the Qumran Library were of the firm belief that the books, the habits, and the practices of the Greeks and Romans were uh, of evil. As to the latter class of codices found in Nakamari, Egypt, only the translations into Coptic of the Metic treatise of Slapius, along with that of a short passage from the ninth book of Plato's Politeia, the Republic, bear actually evidence for the Greek Roman imprint on the writings for years by the Eremites settled in the monastery of St. Pacomius. Therefore, in the light of both discoveries, the influence that the greco Roman culture might have exerted upon the known canonical writings of early Christianity can be barely appreciated, and it seems to have been rather feeble. On the other hand, Rabot's method is not exempt from problematics. His basic theory, the unity of pagan and Christian meditational practices, Cause him to make the mistake that he could determine details of the ancient practice from investigating later Christian practice. By choosing the exercitia spiritualia of Ignacio de Noyola as his model, Rabot, in fact, imposed this much later and strictly determined structure on the ancient meditatio. The analogy, however, is unjustifiable. No evidence exists from the text himself which indicates any direct connection between ancient and Christian practice. Instead, both methods of meditation can be derived independently from the general human phenomenon of Nachdenken, by which possible future events are mentally anticipated. In fourth place, I would like to consider the increasing import that the outcomes obtained in philosophy as a way of life are filtering into all the fields of the study, and more in particular, in psychology or in some contemporary forms of psychotherapy. Ever since the 50s of the past century, an ongoing effort for conflating the assumptions of the ancients and well being and the command of the passions with contemporary streams in psychology has given rise to a colorful range of proposals psychotherapy, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on and so forth. Yet when modern psychologists recur to the past, one is likely to run into statements like these. And I quote literally from uh, an ex-fragment uh, by Eric Kandel. 
So one important exception to this wheel was the set of 15 drawings that Kling contributed in 1906 to a new translation of the dialogues of the Hiteria, Hiteria. Discussions by a group of educated, thoughtful, and deep confidence in love, sex, and fidelity, written in the second century Anus Domini by the Syrian theologian Lucian of Samosata. If Eric Kandel, the prominent neuropsychologist, awarded the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 2000, is apparently unaware of the fact that the Syrian Empire no longer existed by the time of Lucian namely due to, due to being defeated almost 700 years previously by the Babylonians, as well as of the fact that Lucian of Samosata was not a theologian, but a popular, a popular writer of comedies from the second century and was dominant. What can we expect in terms of accuracy and effectivity, if you want, from all the less celebrated psychologists? It is not a matter of blaming the psychological term in, psych in philosophy nowadays, but of contending that the essential motivation spinning the agenda of the philosophy as a way of life seems to be getting get lost along the way for the sake of scientificism. <laughs> In addition to this, the thing is that philosophy as a way of life lacks consistent accounts of health, mental health, and mental illness in antiquity, or how these issues were addressed in Greek and Roman philosophy and science. Among many others, this lab brings up the issue that the view of the body held by science and medicine nowadays neither always nor necessarily corresponds to the different ancient views of the body. For instance, to us, it is almost, almost implicit that mental issues like depression, the brilliance with some kind of dysfunction in the brain. Yet for Aristotle, as for the majority of the Stoics, the passions or the affections of the psyche had nothing to do with the brain since they explain them by quite different kind of means. As to the stories it's refer, they tend to reduce the passions to judgments. In addition to this, one more time, the studies of Pigeur and Bourdieu highlight the effort made by ancient physicians to inquiring about the natural causation of human behavior. The hermeneutics of the ancient philosophical texts and the rise of new methods in psychotherapy have yelled a number of streams resulting to ancient stoicism as a model of a practical guide for living. In order to dispel a sort of doubt about the worthiness of taking ancient thought close to people's actual demands, I will bound myself to mention some relevant contributions to this particular. In the therapy of desire, Nussbaum takes up philosophy as a liter uh, therapy of passions and regulated desires and exaggerated fears. This film claims that people are prevented from truly living because they are dominated by worries. And she continues arguing that the Stoics were in a better position than the rest of the Hellenistic schools to bring about human self sufficiency, tranquility, and to toning up the soul. How to be a Stoic, ancient wisdom for more than living, Massimo Piyushi stresses the social nature of human being and posits that a life worth living is one which takes into account the betterment of society and of oneself. This being the reason for his preference for the Stoic in the confront of other linguistic schools. In collaboration with Gregory Lopez, in a handbook for new Stoics, Iyuchi discloses a series of different techniques of Stoic inspiration that he applies to mildly compulsive consumerism, taking things from perspective, sorry, uh, cutting down stress, or to the enrichment of interpersonal relationships. Oh, and coming to the last point of the presentation, fortunately, fortunately for you all. <laughs> <laughs> now, in consonance with the guidelines in the program which have always founded in his inaugural speech, in the fifth place, I think worth delving into what a philosophic way of life might have consisted of by way of contrasting it with all the external lifestyles in antiquity beside the philosophical one. For instance, that of the religious men and women, that of the sophists, or that of men and women of science. The question rises from the benefit that one generally gets in following the method of contrastation and comparison, but also because in antiquity some personages who neither taught at any school of philosophy nor wrote any philosophical treatise, such as Dion of Syracuse or Cato of Utica, 
nevertheless came to be regarded as philosophers. Moreover, this final approach aiming at the original essence of philosophy as a way of life should be of assistance to assess how far philosophy nowadays has grieved from its original scope and potential, as well as to ponder whether what is actually left from all those still applies to today's philosophy. For the sake of concision, I have picked up three pictures, which in my opinion, which pairs embody the philosophic way of life. No kind of prevalence or subsidiary among these three points is implied in the order of the exposition. I, yeah. So by this, the, 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 first, the first of these pictures is the philosopher's commitment to truth. By this, it is meant the sound combination between what one preaches or teaches and what one does, the fair evenness between words and deeds, or to put it as in the saying attributed to Democritus, speech is the shadow of action. It is well known that what Aristotle wrote in the Nicomachean Ethics, amicus plato et magna amica veritas, but perhaps it is Seneca who broaches the topic in the letter to the Salians. I think no one, I quote literally, I think no one has done a worse service to mankind than those who have learned philosophy as a mercenary profession, people whose lives bear no relation to the rules of life they prescribe. Cicero and Galen often regret the lack of unanimity of the opinions held by philosophers about the subjects they take into consideration. Both also blame the inconsistency between the discourse of their contemporaries and their deeds. Seneca regrets that non concordat sermo cum vita. The memory of the earliest Greek thinkers lived on the literature of the succeeding centuries through the permanent association of their names with particular opinions and questions. There survived also another sort of remem remembrance of them, sprung from entirely different sources. From this point of view, the earliest figures in the history of philosophy were not people who had more or less primitive and long superseded views on all sorts of strange questions, but the venerable archetypes and representatives of the firm of intellectual life that is characteristic of the philosophic man from all ages. This tradition had only general and typical traits to tell those old thinkers, and therefore found expression correctly in the form of anecdotes and epithelms. Uh, stories of this sort were by no means merely the expression of a deep and sympathetic admiration of Eunice's unusual and intellectual concentration, but also gives the false mocking view of absent minded scholars, which shall be brought out in the case of Paris by the compliment that Aristotle gives us to the anecdote of the astronomer who pitch into the well. An apothem in which Anaxagoras asks what he lives for gives the proud answer to observe and study the sun and the moon and the sky. The anecdote that Anaxagoras, when accused for, of not caring for his country, pointed to heaven and cried, I keep greatly for my country, is intended to bear witness to the complete withdrawal of the philosopher from the, that political life in which the Greek of the classical period was wholly absorbed. But how well can these primitive images of the philosopher cope with the more than one, say for instance, the phrase existentialist, capital E, who has no qualms about being out on the streets, fighting for rights, railing against uh, abuse of power and racism. In the present alone is our happiness, Abu makes an interesting remark. Incidentally, incidentally, there is a need here for a study that has never, to my knowledge, been exactly conducted around the question of how comic actors and thus ordinary folks so the different schools of philosophy. Therefore, ancient comedies have not yet have not been yet sufficiently taken into account as sources to obtain more complete portraits of the philosopher than the current ones. But could there, could there be a more reliable picture of Socrates' philosophic way of life? than the current one by delving into the portrayal of Socrates provided by Aristophanes. Leaving aside that it has been done from the time and the format, that would amount for us to wonder whether we could get a better appreciation of German idealism from watching this video. Well, 
The Germans train for two four, like a finger, old back four, can't take a ship on shooting, run from the street with Vicken Fly, Nietzsche and Heidegger, and the midfield duo of Beckenbauer and Jasper. Beckenbauer, I'll take a bit of a surprise. Now, here from the team, led off by their veteran centre half, had a quite a Left foot of their team, as you'd expect, it's a much more defensive lineup. Later in go, Socrates and Pugs are there, and Aristotle as sweeper. Aristotle very much the man in form. <laughs> One surprise is the inclusion of Archimedes. <laughs> well, the second one for the referee, Tom Tom the future plays two lines from the Gumpkin and from Thomas Aquinas. And the other two skippers come together to shake hands. We're ready for the start of this very exciting final. The referee, Mr. Confucius, checks his son and stop. Oh. Be careful now. I guess we've got to come on the outside. Trying to have everything. The second bar. Getting to the top of the guitar. Good enough. And nice to be set. Sure. Good night, number six. We've got the back right. We've got the general public building. There's Archimedes. Stop the cheese. There he is. Stop the cheese. Stop the cheese. A quick look at the Puente Comedy Shigaraci, 1880, the collection of fragments from the classical comedies in eight volumes, suffices to corroborate that almost nothing is left from the majority of comedy writers. Apart from Aristophanes, Menander, Diphilus of Sinope, and Tiphanes of Kyrs, or Evulus of Athens, his works have been either mostly laid down to us or partially collected by Plutarch or Athenaeus of Neocrates, the latter extracted more than 800 comedies. We know that Crater of Athens wrote a comedy with the title Omnibedentes, where he attacks the sophists. From Aristophon, a few fragments of the comedy titled Plato. I have survived and the same applies to the fragments by an exilus where he criticizes Plato. I'm not opposed to the possibility of supplementing our knowledge of philosophers' way of life by means of inquiring into the literary genre of comedy. But to be honest, the advantage we would achieve would be rather means and by us. Definitely, I would not be in favor of undertaking such a research. Now, the second feature of philosophy as a way of life I've chosen is that I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> I've chosen that as the second of the main traits of the philosopher, not because I'm particularly moved to talk about that from the point of view of those who are dead and who use languages that, that are also dead, but rather because I believe that this is one of the few areas in which philosophy still has something to say. That was a topic of which the ancients never tired. Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans' goal in life was to get ready for death, and because of that, their lives turned into an ascetic way of life. This exerted an undeniable influence on Plato. Following Plato's claims in the Apology and in the Phaedo, Cicero summed up their principle neatly, to philosophize is to learn how to die. It is important to note that from the onset of philosophy, it will be to the philosopher and to no other kind of professional to whom the complete task of being responsible for caring about death will be assigned. When death is discussed, a whole series of conceptions about the soul and its immortal character are usually and almost automatically deployed. To this end, a wide amalgam of texts, passages, and quotations are adduced in an attempt to explain what happens to this entity after physical death, and thus, in a manner, it is also implied that this paradigm is the only one that can be counted on with guarantees when facing this question. This is precisely where the error lies, and perhaps also the weak situation in which humanities and philosophy find themselves who are insisting on categories and images which have proved to be sterile. But if it is a question of dealing with death with a certain degree of property, it seems more appropriate to speak of body and of the soul. A certain transposition is therefore required. Otherwise, we fall into the error of taking the true and pertinent object of discourse to another, thereby attempting to deal philosophically with something that is 
philosophically untenable, but which in any case belongs to the religious sciences, to comparative religions, to anthropology, to psychology, or to as many other disciplines as one may wish to reduce in this sense, but not properly to philosophy. If, we, if one really wants to advance in this matter from a strictly philosophical point of view, it is necessary to subvert the object of this course, because in death, what really counts is not the soul, but the body. As such, however, it is not about defining A apophatically from non-A, as if we wanted to improve our understanding of the soul from what is postulated as its opposite, the body. Since this would be to fall back on something that would ultimately prove equally unproductive, but rather to quarantine the whole dualist tradition in order instead to highlight some schools which, like Epicureanism, oppose the prejudice of dualism with solid arguments and with a peculiar perspective on the question, offering proposals and answers fitting much more with the philosophical spirit. To illustrate the uneasiness of the continuous and persistent maze of death, in spite of a life of pleasure and luxury, in the physical disputation, Cicero recalled the anecdote of Damocles' words. This image serves me to introduce the last feature of philosophical way of life. The choice, which is the philosopher's disregard for material good. The choice of disregard for money as characteristic of the philosophic way of life lies in interpreting that this thrive in ancient philosophy experienced a transformation to poorness in Christian monasticism and millinery religious threats. I'm not really sure about that, but just oh. to say it for. The choice of this word for money is characteristic of the philosophic way of life lies in the oh, okay. In the first book of the Republic, Plato emphasized that the free man's heart should be practiced freely, not for monetary rewards. This being precisely what made the difference between the philosopher and the sophist, as far as we learn from the sophist, uh, Plato's side. Aristotle also emphasized the distorting and dehumanizing effect of an excessive content for money. Aristotle thought it represented a metaphysical error. Money is properly and simply a means of exchange and hence has only instrumental value. But the greedy mistakenly think of the process of it as an end in itself, as though it had intrinsic worth. Such a process will be insatiable, there being no natural limit to it. For the Epicureans, it might not be the rule of hell of all evil, but would be the fear of death but it's certainly responsible for a great deal of it. The Stoics made a similar claim. Chrysippus says that greed is the false belief that money is a good, it is a disease. In the Suda, the medieval encyclopedic compilation, the philargiria comes to find as a prejudice, the supposition or the assumption that money is a good, is worthy and valuable. In chapter eight of his The Tranquillitate Animum, Seneca, holds richness to be a real danger to peace of mind. But as you know, Seneca is credited with being one of the most affluent men of his time. It is not too much contradiction praising of moderation in giving advice about money when amassing one of the most impressive wealth in the whole Roman Empire. Section 65, 66 in Galen's in Valentia, revealed the true kernel of the question which is the law friend and citizen. It is all about minimizing the facts and giving things the relative value this may have. This being a skill that Galen confesses to have learned in his elderhood as getting gold. Affliction and preoccupation is a natural consequence for them who regard themselves as deprived of something, whereas those who are able to minimize their losses will never fall prey to anxiety. Galen starts his booklet entitled The Best Fact is Also a Philosopher with amazement at the contours of his serves in most of the physicians of his time, between the admiration they profess for Hippocrates and their inability to imitate him, since they actually do the opposite of what Hippocrates recommends. Galen believes that the difference between the modern physicians and Hippocrates lies not in ability but in will. These Ranios will encompass both love of money and bad habits. A disordered life is incompatible with the virtuous learning and practice of the physician, whose model would be Hippocrates. 
The opposite of disordered life is love and dedication to work, effort, philoponia. In chapter two of this episcope, of this booklet, Galen sees an antagonism between attachment to money and the practice of the art of medicine. To conclude my presentation, perhaps every accomplished philosopher would wish their life turned out like the myth of Wu Dao Tzu. Legend has it that the Tang Dynasty painter Wu Dao Tzu one day stood looking at a mural he had just completed. Suddenly, he clapped his hands and the temple gates in the picture opened. He went into his work, the gates closed behind him, and he was never seen again. So, much obrigado. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your kind attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll talk in the humor. It's always nice to see this sketch by Monty Python. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it, it will be the only thing you will remember. That's <laughs> cool, John. We now have time for questions. Or easy ones, please. Easy ones. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, um, thank you, that was very, very uh, stimulating, very interesting. Um, one thing that caught my attention in your uh, uh, presentation is when you mentioned how important it would be for us to understand the um, ancient conceptions of mental health and disease, uh, for us to engage properly with uh, the conceptions of philosophy as a way of life. Could you develop that a bit further? Well, um, as far as I see, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, as far as I see, if philosophy is regarded, or we regard philosophy as a kind of command over revealing over ashes, uh, I think we are in a way pushed to make clear what patients are uh, from what kind of place they arise. And from a scientific or non-religious point of view, try to also make clear what kind of definitions, arguments, explanations, and, de and definitions are the, from medicine or from other kind, different disciplines in antiquity, uh, how they were uh, viewed and considered. And that's the reason why I brought up into discussion uh, a couple of philologists, uh, which, to my knowledge, are absolutely concerned with this. Uh, and uh, whose discourse and the way they take it is absolutely, fit absolutely well in the lines, along the lines of Herador and other people working in the field of philosophy as a way of life. I, I, I personally, I'm more bent to try to explain what a kind, what a patient or by the uh, might be, or what kind of explanation the Stoics gave to them, or this this kind of items from a philosophical non-religious uh, uh, background, and I think that ancient medicine could play a key role in that. I uh, I don't know yeah. whether I've answered to you. Uh, probably not. Yeah, partially. Yes, I understand mm -hmm. where you're trying. What you're trying to point uh, to point towards. Um, but I was wondering but in what in way... a sense that patients were mainly regarded as infirmities. Yes. Yes, I understand that, and I understand, for example, in the dialogue between medicine and philosophy in antiquity. There's a lot of, uh, of overlap and there's a lot of communication. And of course, when we look at the philosophical texts in this context, there's a lot of medical analogies as well, uh, and so on and so forth. But I was wondering to what extent you could, you could engage in the enter into that dialogue, taking into account the rivalry between philosophy and medicine, and whether medicine does not present, potentially, at least in some of the events, uh, instances, a kind of rival way of life to philosophy. Oh, I mean, Galen's is a funny example of the contrary. Yes, Galen's is the contrary. Yes. 
for, for instance, the, the, the relationship between philosophy and medicine uh, is ambiguous in antiquity. In the sense that, for instance, if we go to <clears throat> Celsius and for century Christian era, uh, the poemium, the, the leading words, uh, he states clearly, very clearly, that Hippocrates was the first to separate the severe medicine from philosophy. But almost 700 years later, almost 700 years later, Galen um, wrote down a, a booklet entitled that the best medicine must be, or is also a philosopher. So the 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 relationship between medicine and philosophy is all come, come it comes in waves so just here. Now a So far as they are regarded as infirmities, and insofar as modern psychology tend to analyze or to expound or to explain uh, diseases, mental diseases, for instance, like depression, by means of or by way of some kind of dysfunction in some kind of natural substances in our brains, which are yielded by, by our brains and our own organism. I think that uh, a good deal of this can be also found, can be also found, or can be also found there yeah, in ancient in ancient medicine. Because when it comes to assess and to explain in what way, in which way, um, the combination of elements of constituting our bodies uh, push us, so to speak, to behave or to conduct in a way or in another way in what we are, what is uh, trying to, to make here is to explain by, by di with different notions, with different concepts and from a different kind of paradigm, but the analogy is there. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Franco, you wanted to make a question? Well, Jordi, uh, oh. thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, uh, your presentation. I don't know if I have uh, really any questions, but uh, uh, just I will highlight uh, recovering uh, uh, a box of your presentation where you uh, mentioned the role that uh, uh, the satirical role, but of uh, course in antiquity, in the case of Aristotle or in our contemporary uh, word in the case of a uh, multiplier has got more uh, uh, philosophy as well, you know. And uh, well, I think that it's really, uh, though, I really uh, intuition, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this thing that is, uh, uh, is it possible to think uh, to um, uh, philosophy as well, like uh, is uh, the detention of institutions, for instance, uh, uh, and, and as uh, the uh, criticism uh, uh, as a uh, uh, Point or uh, as main point of reference, uh, without imagining uh, uh, that, uh, 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 well, uh, without laughing, no, about uh, about uh, the the human condition and uh, and uh, and how uh, and how we live. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, uh, there is only it is possible, no, uh, I do not think you agree. Uh, uh, also, to uh, to to draw a, a sort of. Uh, uh, Satirical, no philosophy will like if we think to uh, Voltaire or to Kierkegaard, no, uh, or also to Nietzsche, for instance, where the, uh, we, we we see a beer uh, the clown uh, or, or the Joker, no, uh, there is no a, a sort of necessity to uh, to know uh, in uh, the history the within the history of philosophy that is not. Uh, uh, completely uh, studied about. I don't know if, uh, uh, well, you agree in the sense that there's a, a possibility also to, uh, to to study otherwise, not the history of philosophy uh, through the ways of uh, of uh, uh, of how philosoph philosophers uh, also uh, learn about themselves. Well, uh, thank you very much for for your comment. Um, Aristotle stated that uh, 
human being is the Geloyal Zon, is the only animal who laughs. Well, I have some students, 16, 17 years old, who tried to convince me that Aristotle was wrong, but I'm the teacher and finally, uh, <laughs> I, I persuade you again that they are absolutely in that era. Um, well, from, from my point of view, from my point of view, I think it's interesting at least um, to have a different perspective because we, everybody who has studied philosophy regards himself or regards themselves as the best ever, always. Huh? And we all have the same common ground, the same background, and we share a lot of things and a lot of ideas. But what happens when philosophers come viewed or are regarded from the outer, from people who has no any kind of background about the kind of things we discuss? Uh, yes, the, if we apply the view from above, uh, th this kind of talk of, the, of, of this event would be seen as a kind of meeting of really weird people <laughs> talking about, you know? So I think it's interesting to have an appreciation by people who is not really committed or to know, whose work is not devoted to philosophy. And this is where uh, the comedy comes in. Um, I, I did try to, I, I had a look at the main collection of, of uh, fragments by ancient comedy writers just to make an idea of if, if, if it was worth doing it or not. I think everybody who is more or less acquainted with classical languages uh, will know or will agree with me that when one says, I know Greek or I know Latin, is saying nothing. Because for instance, after years of training, I might, I, I, I can, get some skill at reading, for instance, Galen, whose Greek is more or less accessible. But if you get a comedy, if you go into the comedy, the Greek in the comedies is, please believe me, almost impossible. The same applies when it comes to Homer. So, because language is something alive, and it depends on who uses it. And there is a gap of time of 1,500 years. And this gap time uh, in humor, the sense of humor, the last sense that Beethoven lost before dying, <laughs> the sense of humor uh, is really attached to the moment in the sense that what makes us laugh tomorrow but be simply meaningless. So just imagine what happens when we take something that was written uh, 2,500 years ago. There is no point in love there, but it's okay. Anyway, uh, as regards Aristophanes, the work is done in the sense that in 19th century, uh, the portrait of Socrates by Nietzsche relied on the, to a good deal, to a good extent to uh, Aristophanes, to Xenophon and to Plato, on Xenophanes, on uh, Plato, and on. So this is, this would be my answer. Probably, yeah. Thanks so much. Is the last question for Paolo? Paolo? Yeah, microphone. Really Hello. making short. Oh. <laughs> I'm making two comments. Okay? Thank you very much, Jordi. Um, I have two comments. The first one is we have discussed, or we have thought about, John has mentioned it, the relation between philosophy and religion when discussing philosophy as a way of life. What I think that you are bringing to the table, to the conversation, what you bring to the table, I think, is that, well, thinking about philosophy as a way of life, but also comparing and maybe contrasting it with medicine. 
Yeah? You are bringing a new topic to discussion, uh, which I think is very relevant. Um, and could we have them? My question would be on the comments really, could we have them a discussion about the relation between philosophy and medicine in antiquity, but interculturally? And what I mean by that is that I, I, I can now say with certainty that there is a relation between philosophy and medicine in ancient India. There is a good deal of literature exploring that relationship. Yeah? So could we, in the scholarship of philosophy as a way of life, go into a new direction, which is to look at this relation between philosophy and medicine in antiquity and or not only Greek or Roman? So that was one comment. The second one, as you know, I can 100% agree with you when we talk about the competence about speaking and, and reading and working with classical languages. What you say about the Greek, I can just say the same and more about Sanskrit. Years of training, and we just look at this text and we are puzzled how it's so difficult to work what it actually means, how to read. To ask them to, to, to which approach this text philologically, I think this opened another question, which I believe is a crucial one for scholarship discussing philosophy as a way of life. And, the, and I would say the question is, what is exactly the place of philology or of philological competence in PWL scholarship? I think that those are core questions that you are throwing on the table, which I think are very relevant for pushing forward the field. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for bringing your comments to to my to my mind. Uh, yeah, the, there is an issue at, at this point, the relationship between philology and philosophy. Uh, all the more if we take into account that Adwo was a philologist. <laughs> And he was very learned in Latin, in Greek, and the majority of his friends were also philologists. But as it seems, um, he felt a bit uneasy reducing his own past to the field of philology. And he wanted to make, well, at least he made some steps further. Uh, Above all, uh, I'm, I'm referring to hermeneutics. So how how to read the text? Uh, because the one one thing is the skill one may have at interpreting, uh, decodifying. Uh, no, yeah, for us Greek is something that is edited in a poema or Lloyd, a very nice edition. But if you have a a pirate, like you have a <laughs> A manuscript from the 14th century, the Greek there, or the Latin there, or whatever, or the, the Sanskrit or the Pali language there is a puzzle. Is a puzzle. So then, probably the professional who is able to bring to light that text, chapeau, <laughs> to bring that to light that text is because of the ingent effort he makes or they make it is probably will be probably also uh, unable to read it from another from a different perspective and this is uh, i think a great thing for the acknowledgement uh, or why the reason why I, I feel comfortable with ago and i yeah I, I cannot agree with him 100% but in a sense that he embodies, so to speak, embodied the uh, erudite who was able to bring to light ancient texts as well as uh, read this text from a completely new perspective. And this is, I think, this is the word of, of his work. Uh, to answer your question, is on my power, but of course. Uh, uh, a good deal of issues is there. Uh, Thank you so much. I think we can keep discussing at lunch. Out of a problem of conscience, is there somebody 
online who wants to make a question. <laughs> No, no. Okay, so we'll make a break for lunch. Thank you so much, Jordi. Welcome back at half past two.